anything in this video is not intended as financial or investment advice and is for educational purposes only. I'm Josh will switch the head of research at Valkyrie. Let's take a look at the midweek market update. Boy, oh boy, it's been a doozy of a 24 hour period for crypto, of course. But ultimately, you know, when the wheels come off the wagon for traditional finance and we are coupled with that in a big way, it's unsurprising that things start to break. Things that expectedly wouldn't be lasting forever, specifically talking about Terra and UST, I'll get to that in a second, starts to unravel a little bit at the seams. And that's exactly what we saw Saturday, Sunday, Monday of this week. So as you can see, you know, this may not be the best representation of the correlations here between Bitcoin, Ethereum, S&P and NASDAQ, but ultimately we're all headed in the same direction together or have been thus far based on the correlations. Again, I'm not commenting on traditional finance specifically, but rising rates have really never been bullish to my knowledge. So to see them continue to rise, rise raise rates are is problematic, right? So, you know, you don't want to fight the Fed, as they say, and we're seeing that play out in traditional finance. And if we're coupled with traditional finance in crypto land, down we go with traditional finance. Now, I will say we have been resilient on the Bitcoin side of things, had been up until maybe yesterday, and even still we're in the 2021 price range, just barely. We'll get to that as well. Uh, this is another problem. DXY rising. Again, this doesn't represent a risk on environment in general. And this stems from the euro, which is mainly what, what this index is and everything that's going on in Europe right now. So this is a multifactorial <laughs> macro environment that isn't conducive currently to bullish market conditions based on my analysis. You know, that's how I'd put it. It's just a lot going on right now. But Bitcoin's going to Bitcoin and ETH is going to ETH and we're going to live to see another day. You know, ultimately, again, I've really never had personal issues with price uh, for crypto because this stuff hasn't broken, mainly being Bitcoin. Uh, you know, the network continues to chug along. Hash rate continues to increase. Miners continue to mine. Price may go up or down, but the until the network is at risk, some issue, which is, hasn't been the case, then for me, I've never really been worried about it. People, <laughs> there are lots of, lots of journalists asking, are you, how are you coping with this? I'd say, well, you know, we've been here before. We'll be here again. This isn't surprising. We are down 50% from the top price-wise, but transactions are still happening just as they were before. People are still using the, the network just as they were before. Active addresses, addresses that have changed over the past week are increasing here. And as you tend to see increases in price volatility, the network comes alive a little bit because people either are euphoric or they're panicking. There's lots of emotions involved and you'll see spikes in transactional activity, volume on exchanges, right? That's how you typically know when we're reaching for some sort of, some sort of emotional extreme, which after all markets are people. So it's a good idea to understand that to some degree. But again, the network activity still humming along. Nothing's really changed there. Um, one interesting metric that I don't think I've talked about in a video before, but is coin days destroyed. Now, all of these metrics have caveats and weaknesses and strengths. And this one's interesting. It measures the amount of days between coin movements. So if I have a coin in my wallet and then move it the next day, that's one day destroyed. If I have a coin in my wallet for 365 days and I move it, that's 365 days destroyed. It's a good way of measuring sort of the unhodl metric, the panic metric, who's been holding for a long time and decides like now's a good time, right? And one of the spikes on this chart is from 2018, when again, we saw, <laughs> to me, you know, I may be incorrect in this analysis, but to me, this represented a massive capitulatory event and or some old, old holder cashing out, right? Price went down. And eventually they said enough's enough. They couldn't take the pain, whatever else went through their head at that time, right? And they decided that was it. Now this could be multiple people. It's not necessarily one person, but to see a spike like that is typically one individual. You can see all throughout 2017, the price rise up. We had increasing coin days destroyed as more and more people hit their magic number, right? These holders, they've been holding since what, 2013 probably or, or prior? And it hit their magic number, more and more people. Eventually that, you know, selling pressure reaches a crescendo for the market. 
and that's typically when you see price roll over. So here, you know, I'm saying all this to say, look here, not a lot of people are unholding just yet. Not a lot of capitulatory type action just yet. We're not seeing somebody who is hodling from years and years ago, unlocking all their coins, right? We're not seeing a spike in this. Obviously that can change if we go lower, but as bearish as sentiment is on price on aggregate, you don't see it from people who've been in the network a while. You know, you just don't based on this metric. So it's not like everyone's throwing up their hands here and saying, all right, enough's enough. You know, that's basically what I'm seeing here on uh, days destroyed. Balances on exchanges rising slightly. Now, one of the things people love to point to is this metric, assuming it's honest and fair. And again, there are caveats with all of these. It's important to have knowledge of what the data represents, which exchanges are listed here. But ultimately, for anything, supply and demand, right, as exchange balances increase, you typically see bearish price pressures as exchange balances decrease. You typically see bullish price pressures. And to see price falling with a sudden spike in balances on exchanges, you know, this is maybe what, let's say 50 to 60,000 BTC. In the grand scheme of things, maybe not that big of a deal for price. It can be absorbed by the market. But when it's deposited all at once, and panic sold potentially, right? I'm not gonna to pretend to know what everybody did in this instance, but this is how you get downward price pressure very quickly when you get lots of coins deposited to exchanges. And you know, you can tease this apart and say, okay, some of this was Luna's reserve, some of this was miners, some of this was private wallets, whatever that means. I saw that figure floating around over the past week, but it represents a lot of different types of entities and people certainly. And we can look to the miners and say, okay, what have the miner wallets been doing? Again, it's important know, to know, tons of caveats here. None of this is completely verbatim because they can always use this for financing in all sorts of ways. And coins out of a wallet doesn't necessarily mean they're selling them specifically. However, for me, I'm assuming they are, okay? So if miners are moving coins out of their wallet in quantities kind of larger than they had been over the past couple months, let's say, let's say, right? They were sort of accumulating here and now they're distributing those coins. They're selling them. Uh, again, this has an effect on price. And when miners accumulate, it's typically bullish. When they sell, it's typically bearish. It's not always perfect, but again, it's another way to sort of tease apart what's going on here under the hood, who's selling what and where. Ultimately though, this metric, if you take nothing away from this video at all, but this specific section, this metric, has been excellent at giving you an idea of overbought, oversold conditions dating back since 2011, okay? This is MVRV, which is a measure of market cap versus on-chain activity or realized market cap. And we can measure that with a Z-score additionally, and then it gives us this interesting graphic here. And you can see with every single all-time high, we get a, a peak in MVRV, meaning market cap has exceeded on-chain activity by several multiples, okay? In 2013, it was nine to 10. 2014, it was 10 to 11. 2017, it was nine and a half. 2021, it only got to seven. It's a little little quieter than previously, right? But inverse is also, also true. At the market bottom, historically, nothing's a crystal ball. This isn't investment advice, but historically, we've had bottoms in the market when MVRV is well below one into into the zero category below zero even meaning on-chain activity is much greater not much but greater to some degree than market cap so we're not there yet we're getting there as far as uh mvrv is concerned something else to note is we've never really spiked into this zone and then recovered immediately other than march 2020 the COVID stuff that happened so my lens right now is definitely longer term definitely two, three, four quarters away. That's what, a year and a half maybe? As far as what does accumulation in price look like potentially? What will it look like on something like MVRV? It'll probably look like it has in a mixture of 2015, 2012, 2019, where it kind of sat in that range for several months up to a year. That's certainly reasonable. So again, we're not there yet. It doesn't mean we're going to get there, but it's some, definitely something to look for on the on the bottom end of things. ETH, more of the same really. ETH is doing uh, fine from an on-chain perspective. 
just like BTC. I mean, it's not like everyone's leaving. People are still transacting. Things are still happening. Even when the price is declining, you're still seeing pretty robust on-chain activity, especially relative to where it was again in 2018, where it sort of peaked and dropped off rather swiftly. This represents really DeFi activity, if anything, that sort of came here and stayed here since 2020 and 2021. Active addresses as well. Or the same here, sitting in a range, kind of regardless of price, agnostic of price. Everything's still on the up and up on, from an on-chain activity perspective. When you contrast this with older coins or chains that don't have too much going on, you'll see on-chain activity essentially just kind of drop off to nothing. And then at that point, for me, I question whether that chain, you know, has a pulse at all. It's got to have a pulse in order to have a price. So there's definitely a divergence at that point with some of the stuff that has lofty prices and market caps that don't really make sense uh, from a use case perspective. ETH's balance on exchanges didn't really perk up too much, especially compared to BTC. But you could argue, you know, this did this did increase instead of decrease. Ultimately, though, this thing has massively gotten drained out of centralized exchanges. And this just shows you the strength of DeFi as far as being able to do stuff with your ETH that isn't just sitting on an exchange. You can do yielding activities, swaps, all sorts of fun stuff in the DeFi ecosystem that doesn't involve centralized exchanges. So let's talk about some of the TA for Bitcoin. And, you know, it had been increasingly leaning bearish. This is Bollinger Bands, these yellow and uh, red line in the middle. Red line is a 20-week moving average. For whatever reason, back testing, forward testing, the 20-week moving average has been extremely powerful at, as a sentiment gauge, meaning if we are above it, we are bullish. If we are below it, we are typically bearish. We have been below the 20-week moving average for around five weeks now. Bollinger Bands tell you two standard deviations relative to price. If volatility is contracting, B bands contract. And typically you see contractions and expansions of volatility. A contraction, especially a prolonged contraction, will lead to, should lead to, usually probably leads to an expansion in volatility. So we're in the midst of that, I think, right now. Another way to measure this is to look at the caliber or the thickness of these squeezes. Again, the thick, the thinner, <laughs> the smaller the caliber, the lower the volatility. And you can see historically volatility right now, despite what it feels like, at least to me, you know, it feels like volatility is high, but on a relative basis, on a weekly basis, it really isn't. Volatility has been declining for a long time now on a weekly basis, but we're entering a period of historically low volatility on a weekly scale. So we're starting to see the end of that, I think. And this could be a fake out, right? I don't want to say it won't be, but historically, if we have squeezed this far, which is only an N of one, you know, it's only this, then this has led to bearish continuation. This could be wrong. However, historically, it has not been. <laughs> so it's important to keep that in mind. It's important to set your expectations accordingly for near-term uh, price action. So to me, this just screams bearishness uh, as we're sitting below the 20-week moving average, the moment we pop above it, then I can, you know, sing a different tune, right? And it's not an impossibility. We did that in 2015. Chart looked a little bit different than it did compared to now, but we did flip flop back and forth in that period as well. But as we sit here, definitely on the bearish side of things, looking at the pitchfork from 2019, just picking three points, extremes in price, you get a rate of change. We are dangerously close to busting below what again can be used as an oversold, overbought metric. Price wants to live in the midline here, this rate of change. And Bitcoin has a history of actually living in pitchforks like this on a log scale, which is pretty impressive in its own right. Um, but, you know, the run up from 2015 to 2018 was also all the while living within this bullish pitchfork that it busted up from leading to, you know, this parabolic rise. But as we sit here, we're, we're risking dropping out of this. We do have a yearly pivot at 26K as far as the nearest support. Yearly pivots are mathematically based on highs and lows of the previous year. They print on January 1st and they do not change for the entire year. Sometimes they're magic, sometimes they're not, right? TA is a mix of magic <laughs> and, and voodoo and chicken bones. 
but it's interesting where we tend to find support and find resistance. Um, 26K is the nearest support based on math in that case. The second chart, aside from MVRV, that is probably the most important thing to pay attention to right now is this one. This is the two-year MA multiplier. The two-year MA in the green here. The bright green is the 200-week moving average, which historically has been where bear market lows like to find demand, let's say, right? They're where the lows typically bounce from. So currently, currently that's around 21.8, 22K, something like that. That'll move up slowly over time, but not too much higher, you know? So that's, that's where the support really sits in my head, the, the strongest support. The second thing, second way to read this is, again, oversold, overbought. Anytime we've been below the two-year MA, it's typically been oversold conditions above the MA multiplier, the two-year MA multiplier. This red line has been overbought conditions. It tells you when things are overheated, tells you when things on a relative basis are oversold. So we are definitely in that zone between the 200 week moving average and the two year moving average. So we're in that oversold sweet spot. Some people start to go into DCA mode here, dollar cost average mode. But again, this is all about managing expectations and being realistic and honest about price action. Uh, the network's not going anywhere long-term hasn't gone anywhere, right? It's seen these price fluctuations before to greater extremes. So when I'm looking at areas of support resistance, overbought, oversold, this is definitely the first thing that I like to look at. So it says, yeah, we can go lower, right? Just like MVRV saying, yeah, we can go lower, but we're definitely in the oversold zone based on this metric. Let's get to Luna and Terra because lots of questions about this, obviously. I can't remember what I've said exactly on these videos, um, but you know, Luna lured people in with 20% APY, 20% yield, which caused a mint for UST, a demand for UST, which in turn means you are burning Luna to mint UST. Okay, this is part of the algorithmic stablecoin, in case you've heard that term. And when things are booming, you know, when the music's on and the markets are up, feels great. What's what you're not seeing on here is the UST circulating supply, which has risen substantially approaching $20 billion. That's down some over the past week, but this is one reason why you're seeing so many headlines about Luna and Terra. We have Jump involved, Jump Capital. It's in Wall Street Journal, right? It's in Bloomberg. Uh, it's getting a lot of eyeballs. We have Yellen, Secretary Yellen, talking about it, specifically naming <laughs> Terra and Luna, right? Uh, because it's gotten so big, so much attention. So everything was great when it was on the way up. And the moment this thing starts to lose its ability to maintain bullish prices, really, all of a sudden the peg starts to slip. People get nervous. There's a lot of trust built into this. You know, the music kind of stops and it's down 50% in a day. The peg's down to 60 cents on the dollar. Briefly, um, lots of people claiming there were, there were shenanigans from a, a large entity who had borrow a bunch of UST to buy BTC, blah, blah, blah. You know, I don't know if any of that's true, um, but certainly it's possible. So currently as we sit, you know, Luna's down significantly. UST is at 91 cents. And it's almost as if history is repeating itself uh, because we just saw this happen last month with waves and USDN. So, you know, can algo stable coins work long-term? Uh, I haven't seen one that does. So I have to assume the answer is no. Now they're talking about uh, selling a bunch of Luna, getting a billion dollars in bailout money, basically to fix the peg. You know, it's, it's, it's a giant mess. It's an embarrassment <laughs> for crypto to think that this stuff's going to work. And again, it doesn't mean it won't work in the future one day when they fix the formula, when they figure out the magic sauce, but it's very much like a perpetual motion machine for a lot of people. It just doesn't pan out in practice under market stressors, stressful market conditions. And so far, the anchor deposits, this is the protocol that was offering 18 to 20% yield, has gone from 14 billion in UST to around 6.46 billion in deposits. So you can see people are clearly concerned that they won't be able to redeem their UST for a dollar, basically. I mean, that's what this comes down to. And the Lunas circulating supply is currently smaller than UST's circulating supply. So in effect, it is insolvent to some degree. 
depending on their reserve status. So that's a concern for people. And I think that's being priced in with the peg, right? So there are lots and lots and lots of issues with this. But again, we just saw this with waves. If I have that chart somewhere, sorry, let me bounce around. We saw this with waves in USDN. It's still unraveling, by the way. This is a month plus now. Uh, it also hit 64 cents, you know, in the 60s. It also was unable to get back to that magic dollar level currently sitting, you know, below 93 cents. I think some of the the algo fears in general, algo stablecoin fears are feeding this lower. So I'm not saying this; these all have to fail at once or that they will or that they won't be successful in the future. But if a yield sounds too good to be true or too risky, you know, just use your use your noggin and think about that for a minute and have a plan. Um, but we can look at Tether and it's been certainly not a shining example its entire life of holding its peg. But Tether dropped to 9997 on the dollar in this entire period. So, you know, even Tether has been okay in the volatility realm in spite of everything, right? And this is the strength of centralized stable coins. So long as the reserves are what they say they are, right? There's all, there's different problems with different types of stable coins, different risks involved. And this has been volatile in the past, can get volatile in the future. You know, none of this is perfect, but it's held up pretty well despite bearishness in the market broadly. Um, and that, again, that wasn't always the case. Tether went down to 85 cents in 2018. There were all sorts of issues and headlines with do they have the reserves? Where are they? What are they? Do they have a banking relationship? Was this signature somebody's signature? You know, all sorts of crazy, crazy stuff that we can say is fear, uncertainty, and doubt. But until it is cleared up, people are rightfully afraid to hold on to this thing or trade this thing. So Tether cleaned up its act. You know, they had all sorts of legal stuff going on. They also raised a bunch of money through an I IEO initial exchange offering. You know, this is a whole separate video in, itself, in and of itself, what happened with Tether, but Tether did recover. Tether's okay. Tether's cleaned up its act, right? That isn't to say that UST can't, but it's an issue that they've had a very hard time holding on to the peg. And another big part of this equation, along with Waves, along with Luna, is that you have market participants seeing blood in the water, the writing on the wall, and they're shorting it. I'm just looking at uh, funding rates currently on. Binance, FTX, Huobi, you know, wherever this is traded. And if we look at these funding rates on Huobi, it was much higher yesterday. Uh, even on Binance, it's still 0.2% negative, which means this is a massively net short on the exchange currently, right? Because shorts are paying longs. So as this stuff is collapsing, you have traders going in saying, okay, I know where this, I know what happens here, right? And that's pushing price further down as well. So that's always something to keep in mind when you're dealing with these algorithmic stablecoins. They definitely don't exist in a vacuum. And when the peg is pressured, you do typically see this bank run style activity historically. So that's all I have for this one. Let me know what you think in the comments below. Like, dislike, comment, share, subscribe, and happy trading.